Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Everything You Wanted to Know About Advisory Boards. I'm your host, Anne Outlaw, and this webinar is brought to you by the Center on Knowledge Translation for Disability and Rehabilitation Research, which is funded by NIDLER, or the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. The link to CART will be put into the chat box in just a second. And you're welcome to ask all of your questions via the Q&A window located at the bottom of the screen. If you have any technical difficulties, please ask your questions there as well. So advisory boards or bodies that provide expert advice and guidance to an entity, particularly from stakeholders and consumer stakeholders, are crucial to a project's success. We know that stakeholders are an integral component of all knowledge translation activities. So how we solicit this input gets a little bit murkier. Today's webinar will host two Nidler project directors and members of their advisory boards. We'll hear from them how they've connected, how they've sustained these relationships. One um, dyad has been friends and uh, colleagues for over 30 years now and how they continuously improve the boards to inform their research activities. First off, we have Dr. Alan Brown, who directs the Mayo Clinic Traumatic Brain Injury Model System. And with him is Jeffrey Lauer, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa, and has served in many capacities to improve policy issues and to help those with brain injury. Also joining us is Dr. Kathy Paez, who directs the Nidler Project, uh, improving assessment of opioid use disorder and people with disabilities related to chronic musculoskeletal pain. Lene Rutledge serves on the board of this project, and she spent her career on advocating for disability public policy in the US and abroad. Welcome to you all. So let's go ahead and get started. Next slide, please. So first off, how and when do you engage your advisory board members in your project? Um, Alan, I'll pose this question to you first. Uh, our advisory board members, uh, you know, as, as you already stated, and our, um, ad, our advisory council has been together for um, upwards of 25 years now. And, and it, the reason that we initially engaged was uh, to know more about uh, what's happening in our community related to specifically, specifically acquired brain disorders and, and traumatic brain injury. Um, um, so that we could better serve them and, and get a greater understanding um, of, uh, of their needs, uh, medically and otherwise. And, uh, and, and so we engaged them by basically inviting them to, to come and meet with us on a regular basis, with our clinical practice, I should say. And, and, and uh, that started off a, a meaningful um, relationship uh, that, as I said, we've sustained over the years um, and has really grown into um, uh, um, collaborating in the design and, and the implementation of, of our research programs. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons that, that our group has stayed engaged over the years is because um, we have developed these common interests in um, designing research that is actually addresses needs and unmet needs in our communities and and that we're involved in them together um, and so we basically all have uh, you know common interests that we address and and uh, you know meaningful outcomes that are meaningful to us both um, and I, I know Jeff can can also uh, uh, give his sort of uh, angle on this as well, but, but we really do, it's, a, it's very much a partnership. And, and once the relationship was initiated, um, it naturally grew and became uh, more uh, interrelated. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Alan. Um, Kathy, would you like to talk about how you've engaged your board members? Okay, 
Yes, um, good, good afternoon. Our board members consist of approximately 12 people that um, represent a, a variety of perspectives. Um, as Amy said, our project is on opioid use disorder and people with disabilities due to chronic musculoskeletal pain. And a lot of um, people in this situation have been on opioids for, for quite a while. And um, given the opioid dep epidemic, there's a lot of issues around you know, prescribing appropriate, um, how do you diagnose opioid use disorder in somebody that's been on opioids a long time? Um, just a number of issues. And so we engage people from the medical community as well as the disability community to be on our board. Um, we have a diverse set of, of, of panel members. Um, some are physicians. Um, one is an occupational therapist, a woman that has a disability. Um, we've got a disability researcher on our group. Um, and, and then people with policy background, advocacy background, um, we've got have addiction specialists. So it's a very robust group of people that are really engaged in the work that we're doing. Um, we first contacted them when we wrote the proposal. And um, so in some ways they were engaged right from the beginning. Um, but we first formally met about six months after our project started. Um, this past March. So this was a newly formed group. And we've engaged them pretty much every step of the way in our project. We have four major tasks. One was a systemic, systematic literature review, which we've completed. Um, the other are a set of interviews with approximately 60 people, both people with disabilities as well as um, medical providers. And then the third is the modification of a screening instrument that assesses for opioid use disorder. And then lastly, the development and dissemination of materials to, um, to share our research findings. And so the advisory panel was engaged um, right from the point that um, we were developing the research questions for the systematic review and for an interview guide to do our interviews. They also helped us with um, identifying experts um, in the medical community that we could interview. Um, once we um, had assembled findings from our literature review and the interview findings, um, we presented those to the advisory panel and they provided feedback to help us understand how those findings fit into the real world and what were the issues that um, people with disability and medical providers were most concerned about. Um, we've had two meetings thus far, and we have a third meeting planned in a, one month. And at that point, um, we'll be discussing what topics that we should select from our findings that we should be developing materials on. And materials will be assembled, assembled into a toolkit. And um, so they review all the documents that we create and provide feedback. Um, for instance, two issue briefs has been, have been released, and in both cases, we sent those out to our panel, and they provided feedback on those, as they will on the materials that we develop in the future. Um, and then lastly, um, they will help us identify the channels of where we should disseminate the material, and also help provide us with connections to various groups of people that can help as well. Um, with making uh, the public aware of the materials that we've developed. Excellent. Thank you, Kathy. It sounds like your project has really hit the ground running and your advisory board members have been key in, in helping you get there. Um, next slide, please, Ariana. So I'll pass this question on to Lene and to Jeff first. Um, as an advisory board member, what has helped to keep you engaged? Um, Jeff, would you like to take a stab at this question? Sure. Um, lots of things, um, but the, the core piece is I think the, the project or the leadership at Mayo, in this case, the team leadership willingness to do two things. One is to take a risk to get into the communities. Um, in terms of a, a medical, potentially a, a medical model, looking at 
how to do community-based, I think it's called, uh, Alan, community-based randomized clinical trials. So clinical trials are messy to begin with, but then when you add a bunch of advocates and family members and individuals, it can get a lot messier. And they, in this case, have been willing to come down and do into the communities that surround um, the project hub in Rochester, Minnesota, and think and, and serve regionally. So they've pulled in advocates, individuals uh, onto this committee from Wisconsin, um, from North Dakota, um, from Iowa, from the contiguous uh, states. It's, so there's a sense of we have skin in the game. There's something happening locally. It impacts our mission both as individuals who show up as advocates, but then I will, I, you know, my day job is um, with the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa and also a volunteer with the United States Brain Injury Alliance. And so we learn how to better um, provide rapid, reliable, and relevant information when we meet regularly with our colleagues, not just Mayo colleagues, but the folks around the table who come from the state agencies in, in the various states, from the Departments of Public Health, from the VA systems, um, from Departments of Human Services and Vocational Rehabilitation. Sometimes these are people that we might be able to see locally, but we don't see except around the table where there's a facilitated discussion. So we all learn around research that frankly just excites us. Excellent. So there's that intrinsic value that really helps keep you engaged. Uh, Lene, would you like to jump in here? Sure. Um, I think a couple things in addition to what Jeff just said, and I think if you kind of step back a moment, it really is about participatory research that we as people with disabilities who are impacted by the research that's going to be done are actively and intrinsically involved in that research. And I think it just leads to better engagement and better outcomes. Um, I think what sets the um, panel um, apart from others that I've been involved in um, with the work that we're doing is really about respect. And it's about really wanting and engaging with us in a way that is respectful um, in terms of the language that's used in terms of the approach that's used in terms of um, the overall essence of why it is that we're at the table as colleagues and peers with the medical community and the research community. So I think those are some of the ways that it really helps keep our members engaged because we really feel valued and we see the, um, the value of our investment of time and we also are invested in better outcomes as a result. There's one more thing I'd like to add, Ann. Sure. Sure, there is a specific member of our group who's uh, as long serving as any of us, who uh, has brought on a number of occasions a spectacular brownie recipe. And so most of us come back hoping that the brownies will come back each time. And if he's not on the phone, Craig, they better be there next time. <laughs> That's a warning, Craig. I, I think you're online, so bring those brownies. But to Lene's point, that meaningful engagement, that's what a lot of people were wanting to, to talk about today. What they felt the value of this webinar was about was having those meaningful engagements um, where you really feel like you're making a difference and you are an equal partner to the project staff. So thank you so much for sharing, both of you. Um, can I just jump in one more second? Um, I really think that one of the things that has set our panel apart is that I was asked first to be on the advisory panel and then asked to be what's considered to be a peer leader um, or the chair of the panel. But it's really resulted in a collaboration between the project staff and the advisory mem members and myself individually, who is really viewed as um, co-participants in this process. It's not them versus us. It's not them doing something for us. It really is a collective we. And I think that's how you keep people engaged. Thank, thank you so much, Lynette. Can you describe what the role of the peer leader is a little bit more in depth, please? Sure. Um, it really is to serve as that 
voice of a person with a disability who is on the advisory panel and respected for the voice that I bring. And so I serve as a focal point for engagement with people with disabilities and I can lend my voice as a person with a disability who understands chronic pain, but also as a person who has been involved in um, disability related advocacy, um, both here in the United States and internationally. So I think it's really being viewed as a leader within the disability community, as well as a leader on the panel. And in terms of the Mayo Group, and sorry, uh, Al, I, I do need to say that the, the Mayo team, the research team, embraces and has at the table in strong participation people with lived experience from brain injury, both individuals with brain injury, and I'm a family member. I have a daughter uh, who's had a brain injury. Um, the, the, the capacity of people like Lene uh, and others to bring kind of the brass tacks of how things are going to affect us. And is this an interesting question to us that we're going to look at or, you know, work worth doing? That, that the respect of having them come and say, we could do a lot of different things, but what's going to make a difference? And how can you help us make that difference? That is huge. And just real briefly, and if I may, um, so, you know, on what, uh, from what Lene and Jeff were saying, um, and talking about skin in the game and things like that. I mean, so, so Jeff alluded to sort of the, the kind of community-based research that we uh, have been doing over the last 10 years or so, um, community-based pragmatic clinical trials, and, and literally those are not only uh, the research question that's developed within our, uh, our advisory group, um, the methodology is, is developed uh, together. Um, you know, driven by the literature and, of course, um, sort of our expertise. And, and, and then, um, actually, um, it's a collaborative uh, – the implementation part is, is collaborative with members of the council, literally. By that, I mean the, the clinical trial that we're currently uh, involved with uh, is, is together with the Brain Injury Alliance of Minnesota. So, and, and in past years, it's been with Brain Injury Alliances of Minnesota and, and – um, Iowa and Wisconsin. So, so, and, and they're essentially designed for implementation, which means that that we also um, we want to make certain that, that it's meaningful and it, and and that we that if these the, the findings are f found to be um, uh, effective in the community, then we can just immediately uh, um, use them uh, to uh, improve outcome uh, right away. So, sorry, sorry, I just wanted to. No, excellent point. I'm glad you brought that up, um, Alan. This is, it's wonderful to hear how you've, you, for both of the projects that we have, that we're hosting today, that you've included um, folks with lived experience on, throughout all parts of your research project, not just the dissemination channels and maybe after your research is being done, but really getting them um, involved in the very beginning to form your research questions, to form your proposal, um, and keeping those folks engaged and listening to their voices throughout the, throughout the advisory board meetings. So this gets in, the next question gets into the nitty gritty of how you, um, keep the advisory board going. Ariana, could you progress the slide, please? So to, to Kathy first, do you define explicit expectations guiding your board members? So including time commitments, what the board goals are, duties, um, perhaps payment for their time. Do you have these expectations um, aligned as yeah. you were reaching out? Yes, we did. Um, so we recruited our advisory panel members when we were writing our proposal. And so you can imagine it's always a hectic time when you're trying to get a proposal done. And we identified them um, basically by networking. Um, so what we did was we generally reached out by email and asked if they were interested. And then we gave a kind of an overview of what we would be expecting them to do. And then um, we would set up a meeting by phone so we could go into more detail about the purpose of the project, what their role would be, how much time it would um, 
would take for them to be um, be on the board um, and to help us. And um, if they agreed to do it, then the next step was we um, followed the phone call up with a letter where we would provide more detailed information, um, and including how they would be compensated. And we have a yearly stipend that we um, send out to our board members at the end of each year. And then um, we have bi yearly meetings. So twice a year, we come together and we meet. And generally what we do at those meetings is we review the contributions of the board from the previous six months. And then we go over um, what our steps are going to be in the project in, in the upcoming six months and where we need their involvement and feedback. Um, and so, so we do that so that um, they can know what to expect, when we'll be contacting them. Um, a lot of times we're sending their, them email during the um, in between meetings asking for feedback. And so they can expect that that email will be coming. Um, and so that's our approach um, as far as um, how we've, we've tried to be very clear as to what they will be involved in doing and what time commitment it is for them. Right, thank you so much. Um, Alan, would you like to discuss this question? Oh, sure. Uh, the, uh, you know, this group has, uh, our advisory council has been established for so long um, that, that there really hasn't, there, there were never any sort of specific uh, definitions or explicit uh, expectations um, of the individuals that were involved in the, in the um, council um it, it um the, the people are identified basically you know like kathy was saying by uh sort of networking and and um talking with others with common interests and um um they're, they're just the, the the guts of it are, are that you know we meet twice a year i believe it's twice a year jeff and and um and individuals and the number of people on our council i think is Boy, probably in the twenties, I would say something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and and, uh, and and as Jeff previously said, uh, from all you know, there there are clinicians and and public health and um, uh, members of the of the community, individuals that that receive uh, medical services and their families uh, related to acquired brain disorders in general and um, uh, and, and other community members. Um, and basically, we there there isn't any financial specific um, 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 financial um, uh, we don't really there's no paying pay we don't pay them anything but we do pay for uh, uh, you know travel to Rochester um, and back mm -hmm. and and overnight um, and you know meal and stuff during the during the day. Um, but but really the the expectations are that that um, that you come and um, participate and and even without any anything more specific um, we've had no problems with people meeting and exceeding expectations every single time we meet so um, it's much less it, it wasn't it wasn't specific you know as Kathy was saying it wasn't specific for 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 a specific grant it has evolved such that there there is in a uh, very high level of guidance uh, and direction for all the grants that we write um, because that's always a, a one of the sort of standing agenda items uh, uh, for um, our meetings but um, but it is it is essentially um, sort of uh, naturally evolved over time uh, so that um, um, you know as I said we sort of have a standing agenda um, that sort of starts with uh, generally speaking, um, us reviewing sort of what's happening with current grants, uh, and and those are usually dominated by Nidler, Nidler grants, and and you know results from the previous trial, what's coming up next, what research questions you know do we want to engage engage in, and 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 then as it gets closer and closer to the to the application deadline, um, we become more specific about this, and and then the, then the the uh, second half of the meeting is is basically going around the table, usually by state, and getting feedback about what's happening in each state, mm -hmm. and um, you know, you know, basically local concerns and and progress and and sort of what's happening in in, 
everyone's community. So, so we, we don't have a real specific uh, guidance and outline for, for uh, what the expectations are, but despite that, the expectations are always uh, way, way exceeded. It sounds like despite you, the two projects doing this very differently, the outcome is the same. People are exceeding the expectations that you have, whether it's explicit or just um, understood amongst the members. So that's fantastic to hear. Uh, Ariana, let's move on to uh, two questions on. I'd, I'd like to skip the next one and just go to how you foster meaningful engagement. Uh, with. Uh, one back. See. There we go. Um, I'm, I'm skipping that other question just because I, I understand um, we're about halfway through this webinar and this is where a lot of folks wanted um, to focus in on the conversation. Having said that, I also wanted to remind participants that you're welcome to ask your questions in the Q&A window at the bottom middle of your screen, of the Zoom screen. So um, please type in your questions and I will um, will relay those to the to the participants. So let's really dive in deep here about how you all foster this meaning and meaningful engagement amongst your advisory board members. It sounds like both of you are doing it. You're doing it in different ways, but I'd like to hear um, Kathy, would you would you let us know what are some of the steps that you've taken to do this? And then um, perhaps, Lene, you can then chime in and talk about how this has worked for you. Yeah, I think the first thing we did was we just honestly got lucky and we have a very diverse group of members um, with different perspectives and who are open, open to listening to each other. So um, it's actually kind of exciting to hear people from the medical community and the disability community coming together and talking about the issues around our topic area. Um, and there are a lot of issues. And so, you know, they're really, um, we had a face-to-face -face meeting um, about, oh, I guess that was in, in March. I guess our second meeting was in March. And um, it was just interesting to see how, how um, avidly the members listen to each other um, and, and we kind of try to set that up because generally what we do is our meetings with our board revolve around discussion. And so um, we really work to present a pretty concise amount of information that is kind of the send off point for the board to discuss the issues around our project, um, either issues that are, are just challenging for us to deal with as, as, um, in terms of trying to do the research on a topic or issues that are of concern on the ground. Um, and often those are the topics that, that do get the most robust discussion is, you know, what are you facing every day as you're taking care of people that are in chronic pain and you're trying to manage opioids in an environment where there's a lot of pressure to stop prescribing. And then as a person with disability who feels like opioids benefit you, um, what are the challenges that you're experiencing as you're going to these physicians and they're, they're concerned about prescribing and um, you're having trouble getting payment through your insurance and yet you've been using them in a way that's been beneficial to you um, for a number of years. And so there's a lot of discussion around the issues there. And so I think that, that again, has helped. Having the right members, having a topic that's of, of interest to the people that are per participating, and um, laying the groundwork so that there can be a robust discussion. So I think that's, that's you know, one set of kind of things that we did. Um, the other just, um, you know, I think Lene being our chair has been a really great thing for our project because um, first of all, she's very experienced doing this kind of thing. She has really tremendous skills and she's really helped to guide those meetings to make sure that everyone is heard. Um, she'll ask some really great probing questions if, um, if the group suddenly gets silent and there's, you know, we're, we're kind of 
you know, thinking, well, somebody can speak up or not, she'll kind of nudge people and come up with a probing question or weigh in and then ask other people for their opinion. So that really helps the meetings keep going. Um, and then I think the, the last thing is just um, we have a process to monitor our accountability to make sure that we follow through on those recommendations. So we, um, during the meeting, we take minutes and we record the meeting. And so we have detailed notes. And then we um, take action items from those notes, put them in a spreadsheet so that we can track them and make sure that we really do follow up on all the great ideas we hear. Um, and then we review that tracking sheet periodically because as we move from phase to phase in the project, something that maybe had been said 12 months ago, all of a sudden now it's really relevant and we want to pay attention to it. Um, so, so members see the results that what they, their input is actually acted on. Thank you, Kathy. Lene, does that ring true to you? Is that how you feel <laughs> you've been able to? Uh, definitely. Um, let me just quickly share two anecdotes um, of prior experiences that I've had that are nothing like the positive experience I'm having now. Um, I can remember being at a um, state legislative hearing and having a local advocate who talked about the lack of value of the state rehabilitation council that she was on. And she said, well, it's always a free lunch. Um, I don't feel that that's the way AIR um, treats us or expects us to be engaged. And I think that we are really valued as partners in this process. Um, the other experience is one that I have personal um, experience with, and that's that I get often asked to write letters of support and to serve on advisory panels. And there are so many instances where I will be named in a project and they will get funded and then I'm never engaged. Um, and I think that that's really something that happens with people with disabilities and that we aren't necessarily valued for the perspective that we have or the role that we can play. We are just there to add window dressing so that an organization can get funded. And that's just not been the case in the um, panel that I'm involved in. I think there's a, um, a real high level of respect between the staff and the panel members. Um, there's a single point of contact on the staff so that we know that when we get an email from Amy Lynn, that that's going to give us valued information. It's not um, a barrage of people, it's one person. And we know we can go to her and she responds and she responds quickly. So I think it's a matter of an organizational strength that AIR brings to our project, but it's also a level of respect for the people that are investing their time and their energy. Um, I'm a person with a visual impairment and when I have the opportunity to lead the discussion in our meetings, the assistive technology that's used is really very low tech. It's that someone literally sits next to me. Other people are around the room and as they raise their hand, I don't see them. And the staff will just gently nudge me and say, um, this person has a question or this person has their hand up. And it's done in a respectful way that allows everyone to be engaged and really has helped me be a better um, peer leader and co-facilitator because it is something that I value. I want to have more engagement with the people that are around the table and I don't see them. And so it becomes a real part of functioning better as a result. So I just wanted to share that. Um. I'm so happy to hear that the, the, the steps that the 
uh, Kathy's project has taken to keep you as a, a major component of the process is, is working, right? That's exactly what we wanted to hear. And you highlighted one of the um, questions that have come up from the audience, uh, um, which is assistive technologies. Um, before we move on to hear more about how the Mayo Clinic's TBI project has has engaged meaningful engagement. I wanted to hear from um, back at Kathy if you use any other assistive technologies to help engage your advisory members. Um, well, what we did at the beginning was we reached out to each of our members to see if they needed anything um, to assist them to fully participate in the meetings, and we found that they didn't. However, um, we did recognize we have one person with a spinal cord injury, and so um, it's very difficult for him to travel. And so we're, we're very sensitive to the fact that in-person meetings for some people are hard. And so we limited those to one meeting just so the members could um, see each other face to face, but um, recognize that, you know, it's um, in some ways there's also a downside to it in terms of accessibility, so. Right, right. And that definitely um, understanding the needs of anyone in your group is, is part of that, allowing them to have the most active voice they can um, based on either the logistics of meeting in person or creating opportunities to meet remotely. Um, Alan, how would you say that you've been able to foster this meaningful engagement amongst your advisory board members for so long? Uh, Sort of as, as we've been talking about um, for previous questions, um, a lot of it has been uh, because we have so, so much uh, of common interests and, and then over time have evolved uh, such a um, sort of a intimate uh, relationship related to actually uh, designing and implementing um, our research projects. Um, as Jeff said, you know, these are, everyone has skin in the game and, and, and not just skin in the game as it relates to um, being involved in the research and, and its design, um, but also we are involved with each other in, in each other's communities and each other's, um, uh, you know, in, in, in other state, at the state level, at the national level in various organizations. And, um, and, and that's really what's, what's uh, let us not only uh, maintain the, the engagement, uh, but actually gr grow the, the, the science, actually. I, I mean, of course, as you know, Nidler in particular um, uh, has a big interest in community-based um, everything, but certainly community-based clinical trials. And, and it's really helped us sort of um, uh, use the science and, and um, to, to engage others so, so that, as I said, so that, so that if we spend all this money and time designing these uh, clinical interventions for in implementation, if you will, then, as I said before, you, you don't have to do a bunch more. If you find something that's, that's uh, effective in the community, then you can just use it um, because the evidence then supported it. Um, and we've um, also gone uh, with greater collaborations with, with the Departments of Health here um, to also then look at the at the expense and and uh, cost effectiveness um, because of our all peers claims data set in, in Minnesota, so that we can actually not only um, see it, whether or not the clinical intervention is is effective in the community, but also to study uh, the the um, costs uh, related to it. Um, um, and 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 all of these people that are involved in doing that are on our advisory board and and so as Jeff said earlier you know everybody has skin in the game that's just one example we've done um, we, we, we've been involved with the BIAs in all the surrounding states with other uh, curriculum based interventions and things like that I don't, I don't know Jeff maybe um, uh, your perspective would be more <laughs> meaningful um, you know Al I think you, you hit it the the meetings that we go to um, are, and as we sit around the table, there is a degree of um, collaboration that is state to state because the state agency folks are there and they're learning from each other and they're oftentimes being able to take um, promising practices back or they're able to share what they're stuck with. Um, professional to professional around the table, there are folks from a variety of different 
um, kinds of disciplines that are picking each other's brains uh, during breaks and um, at lunch and then questions that come up and then person to person. Um, and, and I can't speak and I won't speak for Audrey Nelson and Tom Tatlock, two of our members who I think are on the call today, but I think both of them would, would share that there's a lot of opportunity for in individual advocacy, whether you're a, a person who has lived experience with a brain injury, um, caregiver, individual, there's information from our peers, the other people with lived experience, the professionals that are in the room uh, to, to better understand how to, for either for ourselves or for others, increase accessibility, availability, appropriateness, and, and acceptability of services and supports from the medical realm all the way through the community. Um, and that is reinforced when, when Al comes and speaks at one of the Brain Injury Alliance conferences or when one of the Mayo staff comes down and, and helps with a workshop on a specific topic. Um, or we're asked to, to brainstorm with uh, staff on, uh, on any other number of topics. So we get included, individuals get included in a, in a range of um, brain injury research and uh, practice that would be much broader. And there's also that chance then to bring other people up. We, uh, I tend to bring uh, young professionals up to sit at the table so that they can be encouraged to learn. And these are folks, you know, in their PhD, master's level work, so they can look around and go, oh, this is, this is what we can do if we bring people with disabilities to the table. And if we, you know, treat everybody around the table as if they have value and worth and, and recognize that they do. So it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. And, and very much, very much a synergy over over the years, uh, and and a really evolutionary synergy that with the energy just sort of feeds on itself. Definitely building the pipeline of of inclusive and belonging communities with all of us, and listening to the voices at the table. Excellent. Uh, let's let's go on to the next question, Ariana. Um, this leads into uh, one of the questions that we've gotten in the chat box um, is, are there any KPIs, or uh, I believe that stands for key performance indicators that you collect related to your advisory boards? Or what other method of continuous quality improvement do you do? Uh, Kathy, would you like to chime in here? Sure. Um so that's a really interesting question because I think our, we don't have a formal continuous improvement process, but I think we do do it informally. And as Lene mentioned, we have one person, Amy Lynn, who's responsible for the um, advisory board. So he, she helps to serve as the liaison to the board um, and um, is the one that communicates, that does some of the coordination and makes things get done. And I think the other thing that she does is she's very in tune to kind of both sides. Um, she's aware of what's going on with the board members and then the research team. And so um, she makes sure that um, if there's something that comes up that we could do better, that the team knows about it. Um, so let's say if she hears some, something back from um, one of our board members that that kind of indicates, hey, this is an opportunity to do things a little bit better. Um, she'll be sure to bring that up. I think um, we have a fairly flat team structure. Um, there's really, um, there's myself and then another um, kind of a, a project manager, project director kind of person, and then the team that's doing the work. And so um, as a team, we're kind of all into it together and um, the team really values the advisory group. And so we're just really in tune to ways that we can interact more effectively with them and at what point um, we could really use the feedback from them. And so we discuss it. I mean, it's part of our team meetings. I mean, we don't set aside time to talk about what we're gonna do at a board meeting. I mean, as we're doing the work, we're continuously thinking about, okay, is this something we should engage our board to weigh in on? And, um, and, and so, so it just, um, just keeps us in that mindset of using them to the fullest. Um, and as Lene said, I think there's a lot of respect um, back and forth. 
um, because we fully recognize we can't do this work um, very well without their help because um, they're really part of the team. Um, so I think, and then I think the other thing is Lene has been really great. Um, she's provided us with some tips and some guidance um, to help us be more effective in, in how we work with the board. And so every, you know, periodically she'll bring something up and we'll think, oh yeah, that's a good idea. We need to do that. And so, um, so we're open to feedback um, as we go. And again, like I said, we act on it. We, when we get feedback, we track it, we act on it, um, and we make sure we follow through. Definitely. It seems like that tracking sheet that you mentioned in the previous question helps keep you accountable and may build um, avenues for the board members to, to relay information about how to improve the work that, that you're all doing. Um, mm -hmm. Alan, may I pose this question to you? Do you have any um, uh, key performance indicators or methods for improving the work that you do? Um, so, so because uh, this council uh, within this institution is basically solely sort of uh, monitored, and uh, we don't have there are no um, uh, we don't have to report to anyone related to its activity. So we, we sort of report to ourselves. But as Kathy was saying, um, our board members, our council members, um, are all very. Uh, Provide lots of very highly valuable feedback and are, are uh, and are free to do so and and we get plenty of it and we value it all um, and and but but there isn't any specific you know for example during a uh, meeting there's a specific agenda item or time that that we that we get it um, but there are plenty of as Jeff was saying plenty of time. Um, uh, outside of the agenda, including sort of social activities uh, afterwards and things like that, where uh, where we get plenty of of um, feedback about uh, what we might want to uh, change or or how we might want to um, Im improve what we're doing. Um, specifically, as it related to performance indicators for uh, the members of the council that are are involved in our research, um, by the nature of of the the methodology that we use for our clinical trials, um, it is one of sort of a, a continuous improvement and iterative um, review of the effectiveness of our interventions um, and then modifying them and refining them as we go forward um, because that is part of this sort of process of design for implementation because it, it parallels or, or it's quite similar to what we do in clinical practice. And if we, so we want to test these interventions um, as we would use them uh, you know, naturally, so that that if they work, well, then we can naturally just incorporate them into our, into our practice. So the the, the current trial, um, uh, we is a little bit novel in that we are combining a medical and sort of social model of disease in that using this program resource facilitation, um, which you're, many of you are probably familiar with. It was developed in uh, Minnesota and Iowa uh, ar around here with the Brain Injury Alliances, um, and and as part of that, we we have iterative uh, uh, or sequential reviews of uh, how this is going for everyone involved and we refine uh, this intervention over time. So, so in that way, that's more formalized, um, specifically related to the, the, the granted uh, components of the council. Thank you so much. Uh, we have about 11 minutes left, so I wanted to uh, request again that if anyone has questions from the um, from the, our group of participants, please feel free to chat them in either in the Q&A window or the chat box. Um, either one works just fine. Uh, let's move on to our, the last question, Ariana. Um, what are qualities of an advisory board that you feel effectively encourages participation um, among its board members? Uh, Lene, would you like to chime in here? Sure. Um, I, I think, first of all, we should go back to the comment that was made earlier about the value of brownies. Um, I think that when you think about how people contribute, often it's mm -hmm. in terms of do they show up, do they, they talk, um, do they follow up, but it's also are they engaged in a way that shows you respect and how much they're enjoying what they're doing. Um, and I don't know that that's a, um, that's never going to be a continuous improvement indicator, 
but I think that if you look around the table and you look at the interactions between people, you're going to see whether or not people feel valued. And I think the brownie indicator is one that we should all be advocating for. Um, I think that for our panel, it's really a matter of feeling that there's a shared commitment to the project focus. So it is shared between people with disabilities with lived experiences. It's shared with researchers. It's shared with the medical community. And it's all focused on what could we collectively do better to get better mm -hmm. outcomes. And I think mm -hmm. that we collectively are responsible for that. So I think that's one way that we really encourage participation is keeping us all focused on expecting better outcomes and what can we all bring to the table to have that happen. I think that the diversity of um, participants really adds value and makes us more effective as a result. And I think it's because we have people from across the country, we have people across lived experiences, we have people with um, networks and connections that are so much more broad than what any of us individually bring. I think there's a real respect and value in our panel as a result. And something that Kathy mentioned was really about how we communicate and do we have respectful and open lines of communication. Um, I tend to always read documents that are being developed from the eye of a person with a disability and do I see evidence that we're being respected. Um, there was at least one time where we started out using um, language related to people with disabilities as patients and that was so clearly not appropriate and when I brought it to people's attention it was like oh, of course you're right and we changed the focus of that particular issue brief so that it reflected that lived experience and not used um, those terms of being a patient. So I think that as we've worked together, we effectively are communicating better. And I think that that really encourages participation across all of our board members. And um, I think that everyone comes to the table with a sense of equal value and equal participation. And I think that's really resulting in a really good project and I think better outcomes. Thank you, Lene. Very important points there. Um, Jeff, would you like to, to uh, have the last, the last word on this? Always. Um, so thank you. It's very rare that I, I would deny that. So it, working with Mayo, um, in our neck of the woods in the upper Midwest, um, for generations, it's been known as the WFMC, the world famous Mayo Clinic. And many folks who work at Mayo, and frankly, many folks in healthcare, do for, for many reasons, psychologically, emotionally, they distance themselves from patients at some level, um, and they categorize people in, uh, in ways as diagnoses. I would give Mayo a, a cultural and historical nod that this has happened before Al Brown came to, to work there, but he certainly inherited that in terms of engaging people um, around the table. He and his colleagues, um, they police each other. They have a culture of looking for the strengths in each other and then also identifying where the challenges might be and helping beyond you know, a prescription pad, obviously. The, the, uh, something, so that's broad, but something that's very simple that I think um, Al as project director and his colleagues do well is they have an agenda um, during the meetings. And so there is a clear piece of time in which um, Mayo, this project, uh, the Mayo TBI model systems project reserves to dig in to their issues. And we all know when we come, that's one of the, the goals we have is to offer feedback, um, to try to brainstorm options. Sometimes it's uh, somebody comes up with the idea, maybe if you use a different colored paper, you'll get better survey response. And everybody scratches their head and says, well, really? Yeah, go look at the literature. Um, it, another place is um, that there's a, a part of the agenda that's just reserved to go around the table. And from the PhD epidemiologists to the physicians in the room to people 
who don't have anything behind their name and don't need to have any because they do have um, probably the, the grassroots perspective. They're all equally respected and they have time to ask questions, to share if they have personal stories, um, if they have questions about policy at the state level, if they uh, have, there's kind of a vertical integration about where you can ask at any level. So, I mean, that's, I think the agenda makes a difference. Nobody walks away feeling like there wasn't time for them to be heard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, we have about four minutes to go, so I have a few uh, closing slides that I'd like to do. Um, next slide, please, Ariana. Um, I know this is small. The slides are on our website at ktdrr.org. But uh, first, I, I just wanted to thank all the panelists for sharing your experiences today. Um, it's important to take away that through Though your boards are structured differently, they've been created and tailored to fit the needs of your project and the members of the board. Um, project staff should consider how and when they reach out to the advisory board members, um, whether it be as you're forming your research project while you're collecting data, tailoring your dissemination activities to the appropriate channels, or sustaining your project after it's closed out. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about meaningful engagement, and it's cruci crucial to have on an active board. It creates processes that ensure accessibility and foster active listening of all the voices at the table. If the members are from an, a disadvantaged group, uh, or there may be power differentials amongst the members, take the extra time to engage these members through private conversations or in other ways that are preferred by those board members. Uh, you've invited your board members there for a reason, so make sure that you're hearing what they have to say. And then regarding quali uh, uh, continuous improvement, if something isn't working on the board, solicit input from, what, uh, from the board members to see what needs to change and improve the time together. And finally, um, budgeting. Let's go on to the, to the next slide. There's some budget resourcing. So here's some additional resources that I thought I'd share today. I was fortunate enough to attend a recent presentation on effective stakeholder engagement at KT Canada uh, back in May. So they talk about patient engagement, which I know isn't quite the right wording for, for our group here, but they're coming from a, um, a healthcare focus. So I, that's why they've used patient. But uh, these resources are from the George and Fei Yi Center for Healthcare Innovation. Um, and they provided these resources and uh, were open to me sharing them with our group today. So first is a budgeting uh, spreadsheet um, and they have 15 budget considerations for building an active board. And on the right side of this page, there's a downloadable budget tool, uh, which I have found very handy. The second bullet here is an interactive mapping tool to help your project decide which participatory approach is appropriate for your engagement strategy. And finally, this blog series, it focuses on many factors. I think there's like 20 or 30 different uh, blog entries on factors to consider when engaging stakeholders. So thank you all for attending. Um, we'll fill out, uh, we'll pass out an evaluation at the, or we'll direct you to an evaluation at the end of the, of this webinar. The evaluation link um, is also, will also be on our website uh, shortly. And um, if you have any questions that weren't answered during today's presentation, please feel free to include them in the evaluation and we'll be sure to respond to those. And the last slide, please. So again, thank you all to the panelists who were able to participate and to all the people who have signed in as well. We appreciate the time you took to share your experiences with our board, uh, with your boards. I'd also like to thank Nidler for providing funding for this webinar and all of our KTDRR activities. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.